like I said, we, you know, we've been so worried about technology, you know, taking over our jobs and, you know, robots taking over our brains and, and, and now, you know, technology is kind of uniting us and allowing humanity to come forth. And so I'm, I'm happy that as a humanist scholar, I can now sit here and talk to you, um, you know, for 45 minutes or so about, you know, one of my favorite topics, um, which is the Renaissance um, and how the Renaissance connects to modernity, to the modern day. Um, so my talk is called True or False, Fiction and Disinformation in the Early Modern World and Today. I'm Goretti Gonzalez. I'm originally from California and I came to Madrid six years ago. I came here for love of literature. I'm a Harvard trained Renaissance scholar and wanted to use the wonderful archives that Spain has to offer. I had a position as a visiting professor at the Complutense um, for a year, just for a year, and I stayed for love. Those who know me know that I am married to a Malagueño. I now have a young child, and this Malagueño found me at the Museo del Prado. I've been an adjunct professor at IA's Departments of Languages and Arts and Humanities for the past three years. My work focuses on early modern exchanges between Spain, Italy, and the broader Hispanic world, right? How appropriate for today is just these, these exchanges, contagion now, but real you know, exchanges, these global exchanges. I'm especially interested in the creation of identities, and today I'm gonna to speak about the creation of disinformation, or what is now being called an infodemic. So, According to the BBC, a message attributed to Bill Gates, the Microsoft billionaire, encouraging people to reflect um, positively on their lives, I don't know if you guys got it, during the coronavirus outbreak has been shared thousands of times. It appeared on verified accounts, national newspapers, official websites, Yet we now know that this so-called beautiful message was not written by Bill Gates. The original poster, a man from London, said he published the message on Facebook on March 16th, but he didn't attribute it to Bill Gates. Eight days later, March 22nd, somehow it had Bill Gates' name on it, uh, and you know, and it went viral. Um, now the metaphorical going viral the until very recently aspiration of YouTubers and businesses alike has really gone back to its semantic roots now, right? Um, let's see. Oh. Okay, here we go. It's really gone back to its semantic roots, okay? Um, you know, going viral, yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, it really makes me think of, you know, what, what this means. Um, as COVID-19 went from epidemic to pandemic, information about it coupled with disinformation has grown exponentially and is now being referred to as an infodemic. So dire are distances between truth and reality that information is also seen as an unstoppable, unstoppable illness, a menace to society. To put this into perspective, one that, like the virus, is constantly muting. In Spain, for this illness that is only three months old, there are 6,000 new websites dedicated to COVID-19. Within this alarming number, the authorities have identified 2,000 of these sites as not only spreading fake news, but being used as a means to swindle the public. These websites offer false hope. I'll just name one, such as coronavirus va vaccines, but there's a gamut of, of possibilities here of what people are willing to do to try to cure themselves or, you know, to not get infected. These websites offer, of course, false hope, such as coronavirus vaccines, like I said. So these liars and profiteers are seizing on the state of generalized anxiety, with many looking to social media for solutions that is of now we know do not exist, right? Um, so it's not only rogues with sham cures and fake news, misinformation has also flowed from government officials across the globe. Donald Trump and his, and his administration, for example, have made more than two dozen false claims about the coronavirus since it took over the news cycle. The president has told brazen lies about the virus dying with the hotter weather, insisted in cases in that cases in the US were going 
this is, I quote him, very substantially down and close to zero and assured the public last month, just last month, that an impending miracle would make it disappear. As you know, America is indeed now first, but in COVID-19 cases. Overwhelmed by the sheer quantity of information made even more complicated by authoritative voices that continuously contradict themselves. How can we ever be certain of what we know? How do we distinguish between fake and real news when it all seems closer to truthiness? A term coined by the comedian Stephen Colbert, but even in an even more confusing twist, this truthiness can now be found in the Merriam-Webster dictionary as an accepted term, okay? Yet disinformation or fake news, right? Or the feeling of being overwhelmed by the sheer quantity of information and not being certain of what we know is not a modern problem. We can trace its origins to the 16th and 17th century. This is my domain, or what we call the early modern era. Early because when we, the contemporary moderns, can already see our interests and anxieties being reflected. This is sort of the earliest we can see ourselves reflected. It should not be a surprise that a society we are distanced from by almost 500 years can not only reflect, but even anticipate our own fears concerning the truth. After all, early modernity is marked by the birth of globalization, and with this, massive paradigm shifts. So, globalization in essence, uh, shattered reality for a Western world that moved from nec plus ultra to plus ultra, or a complete negation of a known truth, right? Since antiquity, these pillars of Hercules located outside what is now modern day Cadiz had designated the border of the known world. No one went beyond that, right? And we see um, Odysseus, right? Um, you know, attempting to go beyond it in, in, um, in Dante's Inferno. It was common that knowledge that this was the westernmost extremity of the inhabitable world, right? The Latin phrase, nec plus ultra, inscribed on the collars, on the pillars, means nothing further beyond. This solidified this sort of general consensus, right? This is the end. Uh? Then exploration and circumnavigation of the globe challenged this very attitude. Okay, so as a side here, but an important note, in 1516, King Charles I, also known as Emperor Charles V, used this paradigm shift in the branding of what we now know as Spain. He adopted the plus ultra device seen here, the image of the pillars of Hercules with the motto plus ultra to signal the Spanish empire's reach beyond the known limits of the ancient world. This is still used today. We can find it on the Spanish flag, and on money. We see it behind Pedro Sanchez every time he makes a statement these days. And it was even adapted eh, with a few modifications by the United States as the dollar sign. Today, nec plus ultra is synonymous with state of the art or in Spanish, el no va más, right? The nec plus ultra. Okay. We can think of the so-called discovery of the Americas, since the indigenous population always knew they were there, as a rediscovery of the boundaries of truth. With exploration came the confirmation, although still highly debated, that the world was indeed round, and the proof beyond argumentation or doubt that much of the legacy of the ancient world was open to question. Remember that Renaissance is a rebirth of the study of ancient Greek and Latin texts. Right? So what happens if these pillars of Western civilization, you know, the, the Aristotles, all, you know, all of these pillars of knowledge are no longer completely sources of accurate knowledge. You can no longer trust what you always thought you could trust. In the archives, we see evidence of the effects of this major paradigm shift in the way that individuals gather information. Intellectuals and general noblemen who had previously clung, clung to erudite or more academic texts begin to complement their scholarship with a business that is starting to gain ground, that of early modern newspapers or gazettes. 
1632, Michelangelo Bonarroti, whom you see here, penned a poem placing himself among the subscribers of these news sources or gazettes. In Florence, the poem reads, and, and until another star takes me from these narrow city walls where the limits of my life are so tightly bound, I will sit in a circle listening to the gazettes that now Mens has been taken, now Kern, that Sweden is putting the bid on Germany and whether the king wants the scepter in Poland or just to keep the empire in check. Here, the sculptor of the David takes time from his craft to sit in a circle in Florence, listening to a news gazette filled with local and as we can see, international news as well being read out loud. This is how many people listen to news at the time. Members of European courts were the earliest subscribers to manuscripts, news letters, and other written and printed news, you know, what we would call newspapers. For example, a news writer writing from Venice and reporting to the Duke of Urbino in 1610, shortly after the death of Henry IV, says, Let's see. Shortly after the death of Henry IV, it says, some fine minds say that the King of England, James I, has been killed too. And the gazettes here are full of this, but few believe it. And to season this sorrow, they add another. That the Pope, Paul V, is either dead or dying. Here, gazettes function as peddlers of fake news and are virtually killing off monarchs and papacy alike attempting to navigate the sea of information and disinformation that is distributed by the charlatans and the storytellers or the fake news propagators. In 1526, the painter and diplomat, many don't remember this, Peter Paul Rubens writes to the French scholar Pierre Dupuis. He writes to him in Paris. He says he seeks copies of public news sheets of the better sort. The letter reads, news writers are not used here. Ugh. And everyone informs himself as best he can. Though there is no shortage of storytellers and charlatans who publish and print certain reports that are not worthy of being seen by gentlemen. I will do my best to inform myself not with such bagatelles, but following the traces of the chief events. This is what we all need to do. Follow the traces of the chief events, right? Rubens is both gaining access to a more reputable news outlet and also applying good humanist critical thinking to the deluge of other stories and other stories. Critical thinking was first introduced in this time period. In fact, it was the essence of new learning called humanism that opposed the antiquated scholasticism or old learning. Humanism is a rationalist outlook or system of thought attaching prime importance to human rather than divine or supernatural matters. Humanists not only read texts, right? They not only take in information, but they also question and interpret the language. Here, Rubens is as critical with the news he is as with his technique and art, right? He is a real humanist. Early newsletters printed once a week or bi-monthly offered brief reports, anything from one to 12 pages from other cities, right? So for example, in 1613, the Tuscan Dictionary of Adriano Politi incorporated this term I used this before, the gazetta. He says, a gazetta, is composed of sheets of reports from newsmongers. There were also handwritten manuscripts with less circulation for a more elite circle that could pay larger sums of money, right? So the, the printed press, right, was printing off these sheets, you know, these gazettes and selling them off. But then there were these handwritten manuscripts that, you know, uh, were much more expensive, okay? Um, much more expensive for an elite like Rubens um, for what was seen as more trustworthy news. Who knows if it really was, it was just more exclusive. Often these manuscripts offer the material source for the printed gazettes. So they would take a manuscript by one of those and then you know, transfer this information, this lengthy information into one page. So you can imagine what happened, right? So they would take these sound bites, you know, pieces from here and there and print them 
because of time and space issues, right? And, and, and money issues, people didn't want to spend a lot of money. So one page, it was going to be much less expensive. Okay. So they would take these private letters of gentlemen of quality and, you know, rip them up, print them and sell them. In 1615, another manuscript writer from Ludvino reports on Galileo's telescope, right? So they're reporting on these new inventions as well. He states, from Milan, we learn that with the invention of the Galilean perspective trunk, this is what they were calling the telescope, one can see from Castello di Anone what is being done in Asti and beyond. These two are about 10 kilometers away, okay? So here, Galileo's invention, the telescope, like the manuscript writers or the news writers, are opposed to the printed news writers offers as close to an eyewitness account as one can find, right? So the idea is that if you take the telescope and you look over at Asti, you're an eyewitness, you're basically there, okay? So these, these more expensive news writers are trying to say that their news is like this telescope, you know, you can basically treat it as, as eyewitness. Um, well, they were, there were quite informed, although not infallible news writers who were able to deliver news on such closed off institutions as the Inquisition. There seems to be the same volatile mix of manuscripts and printed news that we are experiencing now with traditional newspapers and peer reviewed books and journals and the constant chatter of Wikipedia blogs, YouTube channels tweets, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, okay, and many other sources, my condition as not a millennial, even though I teach young people, prevents me from referring to this. So I'm sure you can add many more of these sources now that are constantly compounding us, right? In 1633, the Swedish newsletter Intelligencer prefaces the edition by declaring the transparency of his sources. And I quote, I have, as little as might be, and especially in the King's story, trusted to no written relations unless received from a known hand or confirmed by personal or eye or ear witness. So eye or ear witness, right? So what does it mean when a source is this transparent? Do you see what he's saying? He says, you know, for the most part, um, and especially in, in this stories, okay? For the most part, I've, I've only used information where someone has actually heard or seen something, right? So this is importance of the eyes and the ears, okay? What does it mean when it, they're this transparent, right? Here, they're revealing their bias. I don't see this done very much here, right? The last one, I mean, Thucydides does this, but uh, we, don't see, we don't see people explaining their bias. We don't normally think that, for example, the Washington Post is owned by Jeff Bezos or Bloomberg's association with the news, right? But the Swedish newsletter here is revealing bias. 17th century readers, and writers were well aware of the distortion that the news media was capable of. In another letter to Dupuy, Rubens, the painter, once again complains of local news channels. He says that they spread false rumors. The crafty lie kills whomsoever the moth mob bids. That is to say, Rubens and say that the news industry are fabricators of false news, so much so that they controlled by money, right? The mob moves them. A papal bull issued by Pope Pius V in 1572 goes against all those who write, dictate, keep, transmit, and fail to destroy libelous pamphlets and those things called newsletters. In 1573, this Pope's successor, Pope Gregory XIII, threatened and I quote, those scandal seekers known as menanti or news writers, and those who accept their writings and those copying and transmitting libelous pamphlets, right? Wonder what these popes would do now, right? With uh, all those people resending and retweeting messages. A lot of them fake news. Both popes would have manifested against the Parisian Moniteur Universel, okay? 1816, so this is sort of beyond, beyond early modern, but um, they used 
information from the 16th century, I'll, I'll get to this, who in 1816, a year characterized by social unrest, like now, high unemployment, like now, crop failure, and a pale sun, they were afraid of this pale sun, misinterpreted, or used it as fake news, a 17th century study by a Jesuit astronomer from the Brera Observatory in Milan. Okay, so this, obs this observatory, uh, this astronomer, this Jesuit astronomer had showed that the results of a 50 year study concerning temperature and rainfall in Lombardy. So 200 years after the study, the Monito Universal looks at it. They only, of course, focus on the areas showing increased temperatures, right, just like people do now, and lowered rainfall in Lombardy and stretched the limits of the study to report that the sun would overheat the earth and cause its destruction on the exact date of July 18, 1816, right? So you can imagine what this did to the public. This same story, of course, was then reported in the English, German, and Belgian press. Mm -hmm. Early modern viral at its best, okay? This questioning of truth trickled into all aspects of society from the top of the feudal system or the top of the feudal pyramid Niccolo Machiavelli's prince circulating already in manuscript form as early as 1513 but published in Florence in 1532 is a how-to manual as you know for governance that appears less than 20 years after Columbus reached Hispaniola the Prince sometimes claimed to be one of the first works of modern philosophy is also responsible for a pejorative term you probably all know and some may use Machiavellian. You may know Machiavelli is a, a type of uh, champion of cruelty and leadership. He does in fact write, it is better to be feared than love if you cannot have both. Nevertheless, a careful reading of this text gives us a much more nuanced view. Machiavelli also spends much time addressing the need to be favored by the people. For example, he might say to Trump that the best fortress to be found in the love of the people for although you may have fortresses, they will not save you if you are hated by the people. Talk about now Trump, you know, wanting to put up this fortress and the backlash of how long he has waited to act on the COVID-19. I'm interested here in highlighting the subject matter of chapter 18 in The Prince. Should a prince remain true to his word, right? All the Disney films tell us, yes, <laughs> but no. Machiavelli argues that a prince's word should not be fixed, but be quite malleable instead. I quote, a prudent leader should not observe his promises. Uh, a prudent leader should not observe his promises. In order to get away with this most vile of vices, he goes on to underline the importance of dissimulation. He says, but it is necessary to know how to hide his nature and to simulate a good character and to dissimulate. Why? For the majority of men are simple and will only follow the needs of the present so that the deceiver can always find someone he can deceive. Here, the boundaries of the truth are really stretched to their limits, right? And this is, this is the highest echelons of leadership. They're really stretched through this dissimulation and really a questioning of what the authentic self is. Who is the prince, right? We are not supposed to let it be known. So while the prince calls for personal dissimulation, mainly occurring through sight, Cervantes' El Retablo de las Maravillas, or Marvelous Puppet Show from 1615, takes on collective dissimulation or, or uh, meta-theater, right? And so in this marvelous meta-theater or play within a play, an entire village gets into the act staged by a pair of charlatans who, as Mary Gaylord says, know exactly how to pull the strings of old Christian superstition and bigotry. The two swindlers try to convince the townspeople that only those with pure Christian blood can see their performance. 
no one who has a drop of Jewish blood or who has not been born of parents locked in legitimate matrimony, no one who suffers these all too common contagions, there's that word again, shall be able to see or hear the wonders of my show. So these swindlers, Chamfala and Chirinos, find easy targets among villagers all too eager to feign seeing what is not there in order to prove they are who they may not be. Here Cervantes shows the artifice of the purity of blood statutes that force great numbers of Spanish old Christians to fabricate genealogies so that others could see them as pure old Christian Spanish. Appearance as Machiavelli shows Trump feelings and the opinion of the multitude overrides that of a few. Yet in the play we see as individual characters become both actors in this farce eager to save their skins outwardly, right? To pretend that they can see these things that the swindlers are saying so the other townspeople can hear them and believe that they are pure Christians. And townsfolk who start to doubt their own legitimacy privately. For example, what devilishness can this be? As Benito, after those around describe the effects of the water being splashed by a type of fountain of youth, right? None of this is actually happening for still i haven't been touched by a single drop and everyone else is soaked could it be that i'm really a bastard <laughs> here the dissimulator is also caught in his web of theatrics right the truth even personal truths are questioned in continuous illusions the border between fake and real is blurred Five years later, in 1620, the French scholar Gabriel Naudet would describe newsletters as coming from the hands of crude, ignorant, and unpolished populace, one which has let itself be led like wooden puppets whose strings are moved by others. While echoing the anxiety of Rubens's crafty liars and mob bids, he appears to be taking his rhetorical cues from Cervantes' retablo. The fear of disinformation is also reflected in the 17th century play, La Verdad Sospechosa. If you speak Spanish, you know this means the suspicious truth, right? By Mexican born transplant to Madrid, really an emblem of globalization, right? This is the 17th century. This man was born in Mexico, moved to Madrid, and he's a playwright. And his main character is also what was called then an Indiano, right? One who one who leaves or comes back, sort of a Spaniard who comes back to the mainland, okay? Um, Luis de Alarcón is the author's name. In Alarcón's comedy, a compulsive liar disrupts an entire community before he is reined in and order is restored, okay? Mm, though virtually no one in La Verdad Sospechosa is innocent or of lying or deceit, while the playwright and presumably the audience properly disapprove of the protagonist's antisocial actions, right, lying, Alarcón, Alarcón also delights in the character's rebelliousness of spirit and cleverness of mind. Mary Gaylord argues that for the audience in his own native Spain, remember, right, that I said this is an author, um, you know, who's a transplant, uh, who came from the Americas, these stories of things never seen or heard before, right? people are, were very suspicious of things that they didn't see or hear, play on fears of being lied to and set into play the very tension between the very similar and the marvelous, which was one of the 16th and 17th century literary theory basic tests for the power of poetry, a okay? little poetics. In chapter nine of the poetics, Aristotle famously writes that the difference between the historian and the poet is not merely that one writes verse and the other prose. No, no. The essential difference is that one tells us what happened and the other the sort of thing that could happen. In other words, realistic words don't pretend to be history. They create something of a parallel world that behaves like history. And this is wonderful and confusing. Um, yet for a long time, poets also took their characters from history and created their stories from universally known truths. That is to say that literary characters in the past needed to be real people or based on real people, right? Just like we have, you know, uh, films based on reality. It is within this confusion that, that fiction lies. Don Quixote's author calls his novel a true history. <laughs> 
The novel establishes its birthright as a lie that is the foundation of truth, says Carlos Fuentes. The history of Western literary theory can be summed up on the classical dictum, poets, all poets are liars, right? Because they're not, they're not speaking history. The quasi-historical form both of Cervantes's masterpiece, the novel, and the modern novel as a genre move between history and story, which in Spanish, to add to the confusion, right, are the same word, historia. This fictional history called Don Quixote is the second most read book of all times, surpassed only by the Bible. It is the first modern novel and a new story. The story of a man who goes mad because he reads too much is an act of invention or innovation on Cervantes's part. Don Quixote embodies the most modern of predicaments, right? The individual's dissatisfaction with the world in which he lives, he lives in, and his struggle to make the world and his desire mesh. Perhaps the most innovative aspect of Don Quixote is not just his self-fashioning. If we had more time, I'd tell you that he completely fabricates himself but the constant pointing towards an unreliability or disinformation. Cervantes has made it clear from the first line that the text would raise many questions about veracity. I quote, and most Spaniards probably know this, somewhere in La Mancha, whose name I do not want to remember. I do not want to remember, I repeat. The narrator is open about his desire to keep information from us, right? He does not want, maybe he can tell us where this place is, but he's choosing not to. So how can we trust him? And this is the first line, right? This is completely novel. We've never seen this before. After the episode with the windmills, Don Quixote comes to blows with a Basque gentleman. In the middle of their fight, the narrative stops. The reader is informed that they have been reading the transcription of a text written by a first author who has compiled information regarding Don Quixote, including archival research, previously written texts, and even interviews, right? So that first part written in these ways. And it sounds like good sound research. The reader, especially a 17th century reader, would have asked, well, is this a historical text, right? There was a lot of confusion, just like movies based on real life, right? The text of the first author stops here. The second author explains his finding of a new manuscript, a different one, right? The second author, new manuscript, maybe another historical text, which continues a narration. So at the end of part one, chapter nine, the second author informs us that the text we are now reading was get this, originally written in Arabic, written by a historian named Sidi Hamed Ibn Anjali, which has been translated, okay, by a bilingual morisco, right? So um, a morisco a ladino was the term, right? Who spoke both Arabic and Romance or Spanish into Castilian. Whoa, 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 okay. How can we know that what we're reading is true? And how could they know what they, what they are reading is true? The endless versions, translations, interpretations filter through plural authors, right? First and second author, translators, historians, characters, and later readers inside and outside the text closely resembles our overload of information, right? What are the borders between fiction and history, between illusion and reality, between fake and real? The father of the essay, Michel de Montaigne, wrote an essay called On Liars, in which he highlights the malleability of lies. He says, if like the truth, falsehood had only one face, we should know better where we are, for we should then take the opposite of what a liar said to be, Right? So if you just take the opposite of a lie, there you have the truth. Listen to what he says. But the opposite of truth has a hundred thousand shapes and a limitless field. Right? It's multiple perspectives, right? The opposite of truth is not lie. A lie is something that is so complicated. A group of Italian researchers began collecting tweets in all languages related to COVID-19. As of January 20th, they have amassed over 120 million messages or more than four, uh, more than four daily tweets, no, four million daily tweets. Their objective is to analyze what they are calling the infodemic around the coronavirus 
and to see the risk of false information that each country suffers. The pattern seems to be the following. As the threat of coronavirus increases, the diffusion links to unreliable pages decreases. Not that the fake news has disappeared. There are still lots of bots and humans that keep spreading these dubious messages, but its scope was much smaller and the search for information from more consolidated sources grew. This jump in audience to the most serious media has also been seen in Newswhip, a platform that analyzes traffic to media from networks. What we know, they say, is that the people are sharing and interacting more with quality media during the coronavirus crisis as opposed to lesser quality media. If tweets are the new news, then maybe this is promising. Michel Dufoucault said it best. In Les Mots et les Choses, he says there is more work in interpreting interpretations than in interpreting things, and more books about books than on any other subject. We do nothing by write glosses about each other. That is to say, how can we actually know the true intentions of real news if all we do is repeat, retweet, and forward the commentary of others? The management of Facebook is investing in an artificial intelligence to automatically remove harmful content. We'll see how that goes. Okay, so according to Collins Dictionary, fake news is false and sometimes sensationalist information presented as fact and published and spread on the internet. However, a survey by the Reuters Institute found that definitions of fake news are fraught with difficulty and respondents frequently mix up the, these three categories. One, news that is invented to make money or discredit others. Two, news that has a basis in fact, but is spun for a particular agenda and three, uh, news that people don't feel comfortable about or don't agree with, right? So decisions on what is the news is reported and how news is reported are based on, right, you have to keep this in mind, the news outlets, ownership, size, profit orientation, right? Uh, it's dependence on advertising, its need to protect sources, the risk of getting criticism, and the wish to comply with dominant ideology. There's no such thing as an unbiased news outlet just there is no such thing as an unbiased person. And people tend to choose their news sources based on their own biases. So I invite you now to think about as many publications, internet sites and or TV channels as you can that you've actually read, uh, sourced today, okay? To, about, to find out about what's going on today. If it's only one and if it's all sort of coming from the same area, then you have to re-question sort of if this is the way you want to go, right? So take one of your news sources and ask yourself, how legitimate is this source? Is it reputable? Is the source satirical? Is it clickbait, right? Is it just a matter to get to somewhere else? Is it sponsored content? Okay, you have to read behind the headlines. A lot of my students have, you know, have said that they, you know, uh, you get these headlines on, uh, on their phones and they're getting a lot of their news that way. So make sure you read behind the headlines. Does the story use facts to support its claims, especially before you retweet or resend? What other stories does the source publish? Who's the author? Does this author have real credentials? Look up the source mentioned and check to see if they actually back up the claim. Check your bias, please. <laughs> Just because something supports your opinion does not mean it's a fact, right? So make sure you are constantly being critical of yourself and your bias, please, okay? I would like to leave you with Dick Out, the philosopher who penned, I think therefore I am, would have been much more comfortable with having been summed up as, let me give you guys the new, no more I think therefore I am. I, it's, I'm going to doubt everything, but in the process of doubting, I think therefore I am, right? It's not, it's not as simple as I think therefore I am. There's all this doubting before. In his method, method, he questions the veracity of all the disciplines from poetry to history to mathematics. Nothing is absolute, he decides. I quote, these thoughts convince me that our convictions come much more from custom and example than from any certain knowledge. And yet when it comes to proving truths that are hard to discover, a majority vote is downright worthless because one man on his own is much more likely to hit upon such truths than a whole population. So I couldn't choose anyone whose opinions seemed to be preferable to those of all the others. And I found myself pretty much forced to become my own guide. 
So I finished my talk here, going back and forth between the early modern world and the modern world, hoping that we've learned something about how to deal with disinformation, you know, from these ancients, and especially now here from Descartes. Uh, follow Descartes, be your own humanist, be a critical guide, even of yourself, check your biases, right? All this information coming in. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I will now have a few minutes to take questions if anyone has questions. There's not much difference between, let's see, the question is, is what is the difference between misinformation and disinformation? Well, that's a slippery slope, right? That would have been the difference between, um, you know, if, if you read Montagna's On Liars, right? It's sort of, what's worse, sort of a, a lie kind of to save someone, kind of a white lie or an outrageous lie? Is it a lie where you don't have sort of all the information I think lack of information, especially if you propagate it, right? If you propel it, if you resend it um, and, and give it virality, unfortunately, right? Um, it's, it's just as terrible. So misinformation, to be misinformed, right? Um, and to be disinformed, in the end, it's the same thing. History of fake news. Um, let's see, Bruno, can you send me uh, a message via email and I will send you some literature. Um, there will may mainly be essays. In fact, these informations that I have, I did not get from, there is no history of fake news as far as I can see it. Any, at least not early modern news, not that back. You know, there's a history of plagues and whatnot. There's a lot of um, histories of like rumors of um, dissimulation. Um, these sorts of things, but fake news per se. In fact, most of my information came through um, Eileen Reeves, who um, is more of a scientist. She, she works on science and the Renaissance, and she happened to have these quotes, but she was using them in very different ways. She was not using them to talk about fake news. Um, Rubens and um, and Michelangelo, it, she didn't care about fake news. She just cared that the that people were, were listening to news, the gazettes. Uh, she cared about science. Um, so it's something that you know, we have to do some work on, okay? Let's see. Uh, how can the government tackle fake news with affecting the freedom of speech? Oh, this is such a complicated question. So this is why, um, you know, I don't, I don't know if, if, if the government can really, with so many outlets, right, just like in the early running era, right, they were already bombarded with all this information. So I think, uh, you know, something like what Facebook is now doing, um, you know, they just kind of changed their game in light of coronavirus and want to, you know, see more human, um, this sort of, you know, checking sources, you know, making, making sure that they're viable sources, but I think we still have to do a lot of the work ourselves. Hmm. Let's see, do you think there are, uh, what's your favorite? That's, ah, main. Hi, Goretti, this is Maria yes. Osman. Hi, Maria. Sorry for that, yeah, it was a fantastic session. I, I would take one more question, and then please, everybody, if you, if you really, uh, one Goretti to answer to, to more questions or uh, to um, share articles and, and some books, etc. How, how uh, you can you can write, send an email to her. Okay, yeah, this is her, you've got my her, email her, up. So yeah, um, have a VIE. Mm -hmm. So yeah, she's she's opened the door, <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, you can ask her there. Okay. So last mm -hmm. question, Goretti. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending. Thank you. Let's see. Last question. Let's see what's coming up. Uh, uh oh, I've lost the questions. <laughs> uh, are you partially of this misinformation about use manipulation technology and big data control? Yes, partially, but it's more complicated than that. Um, it, it's 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 definitely about big data control, right? Because we know you know that there are bots, um, you know, coming from specific countries wanting. You know, they don't care that this is about coronavirus. They just want to kind of prove control so that they can later 
cause more damage. Um, so like I said, you know, um, it is an infodemic at this point. Um, you know, governments and sort of major organizations are, you know, are going to try to wrangle it in. But this is, this is really a human on human story. So before you retweet, before you resend, make sure, you know, you think twice about what you're resending and giving life to, right? Because we are, we are giving life to the infodemic. Thank you so much, Goretti. Thank, Thank you, everybody, you. for being there, for attending. Uh, fantastic session. Is, and as, as uh, we shared before, there's a link for, for Leading Conflict Times uh, website where we have all the recordings of the sessions, right? So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Have a great bye -bye. week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye and stay safe.